Allied dominance in the skies over Europe reached new heights when the first daylight bombing raids were made in Berlin in the spring of 1944. By the time of the amphibious landings in Normandy and elsewhere the following summer, the Luftwaffe situation had become so dire that the invasion went largely uncontested from the air. The persistent bombing of key manufacturing centers, refineries, and supply lines had caused logistical nightmares for the Kriegsmarine, Wehrmacht, and Luftwaffe, the latter of which found it increasingly difficult to replace lost aircraft and pilots. Long-range escorts like P-47 Thunderbolts and P-51 Mustangs were taking heavy tolls on the aircraft that were scrambled to intercept the American bombers, and with Germany's fate hanging in the balance, new machines and tactics were desperately needed to turn the tide of the war. The idea for a Volksjager or People's Fighter emerged from the emergency fighter program competition between various aircraft manufacturers and would ultimately lead to the production of the Heinkel HE-162. Alternately known as the Salamander and Sparrow, the unique little 162 was one of the war's least conventional aircraft, and to confuse Allied intelligence during its short development, the Ministry of Aviation classified the new airplane as a fast bomber. Specifications called for a small, single-seat, jet-powered interceptor that could be built quickly and inexpensively using materials like wood and synthetic laminates instead of aircraft aluminium, which was in particularly short supply. As the war dragged on, losses to Allied fighters and defensive fire from bombers flying in close formation continued to grow. To counter these threats, Germany initially relied on equipping existing aircraft with heavier weapons like 30, 37, and 50mm cannons that allowed them to engage the bombers well beyond range of their 50 caliber machine guns. On the downside, though bigger guns increased ammunition loads and additional armor protection around the cockpits and vital engine components did make the planes more effective in some respects, the increased weight resulted in poor performance, which made aircraft like modified Fokker Wolf FW-190s easy pickings for Allied escort fighters. The Luftwaffe adapted by instituting new tactics, one of the most effective of which was having large formations of cannon-equipped aircraft attack the bombers from head on. This largely negated their defensive fire, and the attacks happened so quickly that the escorts had but a few seconds to engage. The German planes often made just one pass before speeding away, but on the return trip, this allowed Mustangs and Thunderbolts to peel off and strafe ground targets, unhindered, of which Luftwaffe air bases were a favorite target. In fact, hundreds of Luftwaffe aircraft were destroyed on the grounds, and in addition, the 8th Air Force began sending waves of fighters into German airspace well ahead of the bombers to draw the German defenders out. Heavily outnumbered, and with few options other than to engage the Americans on their terms, within a relatively short time many of Germany's most vaunted aces had been killed, aircraft were becoming increasingly scarce, and the young men who filled the void were generally ill-trained and inexperienced. Though there was dissension within Luftwaffe ranks, it was determined that more advanced machines were needed to counter the Allies' growing air superiority. General Adolf Galland argued that all possible effort must be put into increasing production of the fighter variants of the Messerschmitt Me 262. However, this couldn't be done without significantly reducing the number of battle-proven propeller aircraft that were already being produced in large numbers. In addition, though they were capable of outperforming anything in the air, 262s were expensive and time-consuming to manufacture, and their power plants often had to be rebuilt or replaced after just 10 hours of flight time. What the Luftwaffe needed were effective yet inexpensive machines built with non-strategic materials that weren't in such high demand. If the aircraft were damaged or worn out, they could simply be discarded or used for spare parts, hence the throwaway fighter concept was born. Gallons and other senior Luftwaffe officers expressed vociferous opposition to this plan, while Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering and Armaments Minister Albert Speer supported it wholeheartedly. Needless to say, Goering and Speer won out, and contract tenders were issued to various manufacturers.
Initial specification for the new aircraft was issued in mid-September of 1944. Due to the pressing nature of Germany's predicament, designs were to be submitted 10 days later, and even more shockingly, large-scale production was scheduled to commence no later than early January of the following year. Despite the unprecedented rush, various companies, including Heinkel, Blommen Voss, and Focher Wolf, submitted proposals in the hopes of being awarded hefty production contracts. But though the Focher Wolf and Blommen Voss designs were deemed to be technically superior, Heinkel had the upper hand because the company had been toying with similar concepts for years, and more than one of their designs had undergone extensive wind tunnel testing. Since the time to develop the other aircraft would have been prohibitively long, Heinkel was declared the winner in October 1940. Heinkel's unorthodox design was most noteworthy for its BMW engine being mounted in a bulbous nacelle on top of the fuselage between the cockpit and a split tail, the latter of which was needed to accommodate the jet's exhaust. In addition, unlike most traditional fighters, its wings were mounted high on the fuselage and had straight leading and forward swept trailing edges. Though it significantly added to the plane's weight and complexity, Heinkel also included an injection seat, which was necessary due to the dangers inherent in the plane's proposed missions. For strength and simplicity, 162s incorporated simple and robust retractable tricycle landing gears, largely built with components from existing aircraft to speed up production. While the first prototype was under construction, a number of factories that manufactured glue and wooden components for the aircraft were bombed. Since the glue factory was nearly obliterated, a last-minute adhesive change was made that would ultimately slow development and cause a number of aircraft to be lost. Nonetheless, the first V-1 prototype flew on December the 6th. The flight was relatively uneventful, with the exception that the replacement glue on the landing gear's nose door failed, forcing test pilot Gotthold Peter to make an emergency landing. Center of gravity and lateral stability issues were also noted, though neither was considered significant enough to warrant slowing or halting production. However, with the same airmen at the controls on another flight in mid-December, faulty glue once again caused an even more serious structural failure that resulted in catastrophic wing damage, after which the plane rolled over and slammed into the ground, instantly killing the pilots within view of the Luftwaffe brass who'd been assembled to inspect the new aircraft. Subsequent investigations revealed that the new glue actually ate into the wood, which was supposed to bond. Flight testing continued while a suitable replacement adhesive could be found, but in the meantime, speeds were limited to just 310 miles per hour until the second prototype flew just before Christmas. Stability was still an issue, but since the plane was planned to enter production in just a few weeks, there was no time for major design changes, though the addition of larger tail surfaces and ballast in the nose improved handling significantly. The new and improved third and fourth prototypes flew in mid-January 1945, both of which included the 162's characteristic dropping wingtips and twin 30mm cannons protruding from recessed areas below and to the sides of the cockpit. But though the cannons packed a nasty punch, their excessive recoil caused undue stress on the already questionable glue and wood airframes. On later production models, they were ultimately replaced with 20mm cannons, which were lighter and could carry nearly twice as much ammunition. But though the aircraft's weight was originally intended to be just 4,400 pounds, by the time various improvements had been made, it had ballooned to more than 6,000 pounds, though with its high power to weight ratio, performance still remained exceptional. However, one big drawback was that with just one 183-gallon internal fuel tank, flight duration was limited to just 30 minutes, though some later production variants had additional tanks located in each inner wing panel. To minimize the likelihood of one lucky bombing rate halting production, manufacturing facilities were downsized and spread over a relatively large area. Initial projections caused for nearly a thousand units to be built each month, but as was the case with everything from tanks and guns to aircraft and ships, actual production numbers were far less. Measuring just 30 feet long and 24 feet from wingtip to wingtip, original design specs called for 162s to have maximum takeoff weights of just 4,400 pounds, while power would come from a single BMW 109 turbojet engine rated to approximately 1,800 pounds of thrust. Though not particularly powerful by jet standards, the BMW power plants would be more than capable of propelling the small aircraft past 470 miles per hour, though later flight testing would reveal a significantly higher top speed, approaching 500 and 
160 miles per hour with an emergency boost. Nearly 100 miles an hour faster than anything the Allies had, 162s also had exceptional climb rates approaching 4,600 feet per minute compared to just 3,500 feet per minute for Mustangs. Unlike other aircraft, the 162's frame and structural components would be made largely of wood, and though they weren't free from bolts, screws, and rivets, most were held together by the aforementioned glue, with which there was abundant issues. Not only would the aircraft be light and at least theoretically strong, but they'd be able to be built by unskilled and in some cases slave labor. But perhaps most importantly, since it was likely that many new pilots would come from relatively inexperienced ranks of the Hitler Youth, above all else, 162s needed to be easy to fly after just cursory training, much of which would be spent practicing takeoffs and landings. Although originally intended to be flown by young, unqualified pilots, the aircraft's increased complexity made this a particularly foolhardy plan. However, in the absence of a suitable alternative, both two-seat trainers and unpowered glider training variants were built, but as the Luftwaffe's situation worsened, production was shifted almost entirely to combat-ready machines. The first aircraft were delivered to Test Unit 162 in January of 1945, after which they were briefly put through their paces and rushed into service. The first HE-162 saw combat on the 19th of April 1945 when pilot Gunther Kirchner downed an RAF fighter. However, Kirchner's victory celebration would be short-lived as he was killed later the same day by an English airman flying a Hawker Tempest. Kirchner actually survived the barrage from Tempest machine gun and ejected, but his parachute failed to open and he was killed instantly when he hit the ground. Aircraft from GJ-1 did make additional fighter kills and damage a number of bombers, but in the end, they took far more punishment than they ever dished out. All told, 13 aircraft and 10 pilots were lost in less than a month, most of which resulted in structural failures, engine malfunctions, and in a few instances, the aircraft running out of fuel. In the war's waning days, surviving HE-162s were spread too thin to make much of a difference, and when General Admiral Hans George von Friedelberg officially surrendered all German armed forces in the Netherlands, Northwest Germany, and Denmark on May the 5th, all of them were grounded. In the following days, Allied troops took control of a number of key airfields across Europe, and dozens of 162s were packed up and whisked away to America, Britain, and the Soviet Union, where they underwent extensive testing and evaluation. Dozens more had been destroyed by crews intent on preventing them from falling into enemy hands, but by the time of Germany's unconditional surrender on March the 8th, only 120 had been delivered. Approximately 600 additional aircraft were discovered in various stages of completion. Heinkel's HE-162s only served between January and May of 1945, and though official statistics are hard to come by, it's likely they weren't solely responsible for the downing of a single Allied bomber. As is the case with many of Nazi Germany's most revolutionary weapons, their ineffectiveness wasn't the direct result of inherent design flaws, but because they were rushed into service prematurely and built in too few numbers. Both Luftwaffe airmen who'd piloted them in combat and Allied aviators who'd flown captured aircraft after the war considered them exceptional machines in many respects. Fleet Air Arm pilot Eric Winkle Brown, who purportedly flew nearly 500 aircraft, said 162s were fast, stable, and nimble, though shortly after making this statement, one of his counterparts was killed while flying a People's Fighter during a demonstration near Farnborough after one of the plane's tail fins sheared off during a low-level roll. At the Nuremberg trials, Hermann Goering famously opined that, "...when I saw Mustangs over Berlin, I knew the jig was up." Likewise, after the war, Ernst Heinkel categorically stated that it was wholly unrealistic to think that ill-trained teenagers could fly such complex, high-performance machines, and that it went a long way toward highlighting the unbridled fanaticism that permeated the upper echelons of the Third Reich at the time, even when it should have been apparent that the war was unwinnable. Now, just before you leave today, maybe you're looking for something else to watch. Why not check out my new channel called War Graphics? Want to know all of the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War Graphics from Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa. If it's got people fighting each other or occasionally animals, we will cover it. There is a link below.